All right, so why don't we get started, Carol? Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to welcome you to the MDK virtual hangout. I'm coming from Nashville, Tennessee. Carol, where are you coming from? I'm Cork, Ireland, very south of Ireland. Oh, dreamy. Uh, I'm going to get there. It's going to take a bit. I don't know <laughs> if you call. So everybody, thank you for coming. We're going to be talking with Carol about um, all kinds of things. We have a, you know, our beloved field guide that we did with her. Ta-da. Field guide number 14, refresh. Um, I was just talking with Carol about what the publication date was for this field guide and how it seems kind of mind boggling to think about, um, wow. This was published on April 10th, 2020. So when I think back on what the world was like and what we were like in April of 2020, and for me, how much comfort I got from working with your designs, Carol, during the very, very first days of the pandemic, um, it, it really brought back a lot of memories, you know, because I think at the time we didn't really know what to expect about much of anything, but we had yeah. been working field guide with you for months, you know, and we had um, come through the whole process of designing, you know, working your designs out, um, figuring out what, you know, it's always a really fun process to, to try to sort out what's going to be in the field guide, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it was nice to have something familiar to work on when the whole world felt like it was in chaos. That was because we had got, we were getting close to the, the finish line. We knew what it was going to look like. So it was, it was, it was nice to have that to work on and the videos and things at the time. Yeah. So, so we're going to um, be talking this, this hour, uh, probably about an hour or so with Carol. Um, we're going to be talking about these designs in the field guide. Um, we're going to be talking about the yarn, which I think this is a really amazing uh, thing that was able to happen, which is to have a designer working in the very yarn that she herself designed, you know, Carol, Carol's yarn, Nua is the thing that we're doing a big special promotion for right now. It's called an MDK gem. And it's when we highlight a designer and a yarn that we really love. And we'll be, you know, if you if you purchase any new yarn through Wednesday this week, we will include a free ebook of Field Guide 14 when you make that order. So it's a, a wonderful opportunity to dive in. If you haven't experienced Carol's yarn, it, it truly is one of our readers favorites. Um, we hear about it all the time and um, we just brought in a big pile of it, but it's already, <laughs> people are very happy to be bringing it home. So um, yeah, I'm watching the comments up here and we've got lots of love, love in US. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really special yarn. I mean, the fibers, well, let's just talk about that for a second. Tell me about, um, tell me about how you ended up with this yarn, which is a blend and a really specific and unusual blend. It was it was kind of a compilation job because I started off not really thinking that I could create a yarn because I started as a designer. I have very specific yarns that I like to work with. Um, and my distributor fiber space had been um, they had been doing books and patterns with me and we were at the TNA trade show and they had started a yarn line with someone else and I remember going oh I'd love my own yarn line and Jenny's like well, you can do one. <laughs> I'm like really. And, but it took another year after that where I started talking with Andy and he came, he said, okay, uh, what kind of, what do you want in the yarn? And my two things that I really wanted were I wanted it sports weight because there's not a lot of sports weight over in Ireland. And I do so much garment design and I find sport weight is a really nice weight for, for garment design because it's, it's not too heavy, but it's not so light that it's going to take you forever to knit. And then the other one is I didn't want superwash again, because I'm a, primarily a garment designer superwash for garments doesn't hold its shape quite as well that you've got the thick surface so good for other things but for garments it's harder for it to hold its shape so those were the two things that I came into and then the combination Andy was just kind of throwing out some ideas he's like okay merino's a good base so we'll start with 60 percent merino and then he suggested yak and linen and I hadn't really worked with yak and he was talking about he said well yak is a bit very similar to cashmere in the level of softness but it's not as expensive so I'm like that sounds like a great combination to me so that's how yak got in there and then the linen was a bit of a nod to the Irish heritage because there is a very strong yeah linen heritage in Ireland particularly in Northern Ireland 
So the linen was kind of bringing that in. Now, that was where we started. What it did, the yarn ended up being a nice unexpected surprise because the yak has got a, kind of a naturally a beigey, light brown color to it. So that all of the colors that we over dyed then had kind of a rustic base to it. You're never going to get, you can't get a cream color with it unless you went and dyed it again. So that kind of really created the color, the basis of the color palette. And then the linen, um, because it's a plant fiber, dyes differently. So you get the, I've actually even got some here, you get the little flecks of what looks like tweed running through it, but it's actually the linen and the fact that it dyes differently. Yeah, so particularly in the darker colors, it becomes much more obvious that it's not a one flat color, even though it's a solid dye, because of the different fibers in it, basically creating the, the color variability. Um, so that was where the actual, the first couple of bits of the yarn came from. Then the colors, uh, I had fun doing this because this is where I really came into my own because I knew what colors I wanted. <laughs> well, your color um, names, we're going to get to that in a minute. Your colors names are quite amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's another another whole story. But yeah, the colors I had two. there was kind of two bases of what I wanted. I had, I wanted a good neutral base ranging from lighter to darker that you could use kind of as to anchor everything in. So you've got... Um, the, the lighter beiges, the undyed colors and like grays up to dark grays and then some light and dark um, blues and greens as well. And then went with the color, a couple of color pops that just colors I love, you know, um, I won't call out the names because I'll just spoil the surprise, but a few bright colors to go in with it. So that was kind of like, I wanted base range of fairly neutral colors and then a few color pops that you could kind of combine in any way. And the idea being that you should be able to take up pretty much any two colors from the range and they should work pretty well together. Like that's probably stretching it a bit, but more or less that that's the general idea. <laughs> a truly amazing palette because uh, they they do all work together. I mean, when we were working on the field guide, we spent a lot of time looking at, you know, the palette for the field guide itself. And it, there was no bad pick, you know, it did, it, it's really well designed and I'm just so happy that you made it because it's, I, mean, it's I still it, love it. I mean, it's been, I think it was about 2017. We actually put the yarn range together, first of all, and this is the sports weight. We've added a worsted and we've kind of added a few more colors over the years, but I still really like working with the yarn. When I pick it up and I haven't worked with it for a few months, I'm like, oh, I forgot how much I like this. Um, <laughs> wow, I did a great thing. This is <laughs> No, it it no. feels like it's outside of me. Like I know I was part of the creation, but like it, it, it's got its own little identity outside of me at this stage, you know? Absolutely. Um, and yeah, we just, uh, you know, it's just gorgeous stuff. And it makes, um, you know, I think, well, we can talk about this too, but your, uh, your focus tends to be on garments and um, super things that you really do wear. It's not like you're making, yeah. you know, decorative hand knitting, which is a super fun thing, but this is a completely wearable palette. I think I, all the yeah. colors, it's really um, quite extraordinary. So um, before we get to the designs in the field guide, can you talk us through a little bit of how you ended up in this world of being a knitwear designer? I think you have mm -hmm. an interesting story. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, most designers come at it a little bit skew ways. It's never really a direct route in. So like I would have started knitting when I was small. So I've always, I've never remembered not knitting that I would have learned in school um, and my mother and my grandmother and also would have knit. Um, so like six, seven, and I would have gotten a lot of yarns from at home from my aunt who ran a yarn shop. So like big things of cotton and chenille and things like that. So I would make garments for myself, my dolls and things like that. And then stopped during my teenage years and leaving school, I couldn't figure out what to do. I would have a very strong, both artistic and mathematical side, which is really hard to combine. So I started in art college for a year doing it, um, just a foundation course and really got on well in textile design but then miss maths and science. So I went back to do structural engineering. So it's like I, I kind of swung from one direction to another, but not, neither of them were really right. And it wasn't until my youngest was born and I rediscovered knitting it just for me going, I sold to business and I'm like, I'm going to become a full-time mom. This would be great. And a couple of months in, I'm like, I'm really busy. I'm really tired, but I want something for myself. And knitting became that. And I just threw myself into relearning how to knit. And within a couple of months, I started designing 
and started to realize very quickly it was the best mashup between the the more creative side and the mathematical side because I could use both together and both are completely necessary as a network design and both an advantage so um, I was in my happy place with, uh, learning how to become a network designer but it, it, it is garments I love like if, if someone sits me down to design something it'll be a garment I want to design and um, I just I like knitting stuff you can wear yeah when I when I heard that you had had a background in engineering when we were beginning working on the field guide um, and then I went and looked through your patterns I it's just like it's obvious that you really enjoy structure and yeah. the construction of, of these pieces. Every one of them has something special and unusual about it. Um, I guess uh, we could start by talking about this wrap. This was the piece I made um, right right when the field guide was coming out. Kay and I try. Oh, by the way, Kay's not here, you guys. I meant to, to mention this. Um, she's not invisible. <laughs> she's a victim of our current air travel um, amazing weirdness she had a flight that was supposed to leave at midnight tonight and she's going on a birthday trip it's her birthday last month but she's celebrating now um but they moved the flight up eight hours instead of like i've never heard of such a thing so she <laughs> she had to totally re-scramble everything to get to the airport in time for this flight so we miss Kay, and i know she's very sad not to be here carol but um just, I hope she hits her flight. Honestly, they could change it again. You know, oh. Oh. <laughs> the randomness of life. Uh, so this wrap, so early in the pandemic, I, I just dove right in. It's okay. We were talking about construction. I think it's called the twining wrap, mm -hmm. a good name for th a piece that has all sorts of crazy cables in it. Um, you can see it starts. It's just so much fun. It starts here. You know, it starts with like yeah. a little, little tiny cast on. So you don't, waste a minute getting into the cables. Carol, can you talk through kind of what your yep. structure on this? Yeah, so with this, what you're doing is you're, you're building out. So you start with a tiny little couple of stitches and then the first little triangle, you're building out enough stitches to begin that cable. And then when that's done, you move a little further out and that first cable is established and keeps working its way up there, but you start increasing for the next cable. Mm -hmm. And once that one is complete, you get to move on up. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember, was there one more cable here? We kind of move on and no, we're back to the first yes. one. So once that one is complete across here, then that is your, your module, so to speak. And yeah. so then you can start again. So I, with ones like this to try and keep the pattern simplified um, and easy to follow, I like to create a very, very modular effect so that by the time you finish this first repeat, it's exactly at the point where you can start the next one so that each one fits in next to each other. So it's easy to write the pattern. It's easy to follow. And also, if someone wants to make it shorter or longer, you, you just know exactly how to do it because it's just a matter of putting another building block in. See, I'm totally an engi a structural engineer. Even when I'm designing, it's like I think of everything as little building blocks that it has to all fit in very neatly next to each other and you tweak the stitches to to make that happen you know yeah um, i it was very very fun it has like a beautiful i cord edge and it, it's it's not is it i cord it's not really i cord it's just it behaves like i cord you know yeah it's it's this one it, it is it is it is an i cord edge when you're slipping it like that it's just an integrated i cord but it does it creates a very neat fold and it's easy to do and more importantly, you don't have to come back and do it afterwards so that it's when you're done, you're done uh, at the coming it's out a, the side. Yeah, it's a beautiful effect. And then at the end, at the very, very end, when you've got your full set of repeats, you did like a Pico bind off. Pico, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually, for, for ones like this, I'm quite fond of Pico bind offs because it gives you so much extra stretch um, and just a small little bit more decorative finish as well. Now, I mean, they would be very easy to just do an i core bind off if someone prefers something a little simpler. So like I, I'm, I'm big in people modifying as they go along. It's like making them your own. Because when I start off as a designer, that's my creative input. I'm like, this is what I do. This is how you put it together. And then every time a knitter takes it, you pick your color, you pick the size you want, and you can you know, add or take away little details to make it your own at that point. 